Greetings, pair sharpens and retrogrades. Happy Friday. Friday is here once again. And that means that Christian masculinism is here as an episode treating of something that's important to your world. It might not be something making the headlines today. In fact, we know it's not. It's something they're keeping out of the headlines. Today, the CMAS crew is complete once again. Michael Robillard is back, my buddy Michael, and my co-author on Don't Go to College. Uh, so he's he's back after a, a week-long layoff. Also, my friend Will Nolan from Nolan Knows, and my very, very, very strong friend, Elliot Holes. How the hell are you guys? Not bad. How, How are you, Tim? Yeah, well, thanks. Yeah. All of you are strong dudes, mm -hmm. by the way. I just... Uh, ran out of stuff to say. So, <laughs> that's a, but uh, anyway, I wanted to talk to the parish orphans and the retrogrades about something that's not so linearly linked to even my oh, case for patriarchy uh, book, uh, which is which is girls in sports. And the topic today is why, why, why would Agenda Twenty Thirty? which I'm not sure maybe you guys can help me straighten this out. Are, are they good guys or bad guys? Why did they want young girls in sports? We've got quite the answer to this rhetorically post bowling pin of a question, and we're going to knock it down right now. So, um, Will, you, you took the first crack at this when we were just goofing off here. Why would it be that Agenda 2030 wants girls <laughs> in sports? Well, girls can dream big. Feminism says, unless that dream involves being a housewife, the yes. things you're allowed to dream about are basically being little boys, being men, and excelling in traditionally male fields. Because there's one thing that feminism hates, and it is femininity. Feminism is a form of misogyny. And if you can push girls into male competitive arenas, then you are going to devalue the traditionally feminine roles. It's all about status, competition, hierarchy, dominance, aggression, and you're giving them what is essentially a masculine worldview. Absolutely. I mean, all, all of us here have competed at um, varying offices of high levels in sports. And what I mean... We let's let's be honest. We know around the time we were in middle school, we're all around the same age. I, there was a there's beginning to be a push for female sports in the female sports section of Case for Patriarchy. Elliot, I'll direct this to you. I I uh, recount a story which is not typical for me. I'm not usually a a, a personal anecdote sharer in my books, but one that I remember is seventh grade. Uh, you know, we had a we had a, an important basketball team. Our our school only had one team that did well. It was basketball. Uh, I was one of the two stars that was getting noticed in the metropolitan area. And my English teacher, you know, literature, whatever it is in seventh grade, took it upon herself to kind of dress us down in class. And she was like, well, there's this girl. I'm going to call her Mia. It's not a real name. Mia is as good as any of you boys, I've seen her. And like, we just come from gym. She had this, this chick, Mia had always tried to run with the boys. She was like worse than the, the dorky kid, you know, who, who wasn't good at basketball at all and got picked last in an all boys game. And yet you have this teacher dressing us down and pushing this agenda, telling this poor Mia, who was a tomboy, that she was better, you know, far better than she was. And, and really taking it upon herself to dress down by name me and this other kid and she's like i don't know why anyone thinks anything about the boys team it's you know this girl's better than any of you it's just a lie it's just a lie so elliot there's two sides to the lie you're ripping down men's sports and you're building up women's sports folks see my title and they want to know why is this wrong <laughs> yeah that's a good question and you know i struggle because i think there's great value in girls sports and my daughters play soccer and the options that are available for them recreationally uh, are not nearly as positive as getting physically active in sports for example 
theater. One of my daughters, we had her involved in theater for a little while. And you know, the theater crew is totally gay. They just get more and more LGBT pro uh, and weird as time goes on. I don't know why that's the case, but theater always seems to attract those types. Uh, once we got her out of that and we got her into soccer, a lot of, you know, like some of the weird ideas that she was coming home and trying to propose went away. It kind of cleared up <laughs> some issues. I think personally that women's sports are amazing if you let them be what they are. Let it be what it is, which is a form of recreation and exercise and physical expression that is healthy for the female, but don't try to make it into men's sports. Don't try to have it compete with men's sports. Don't compare it to men's sports. They're totally different things, right? Why can't women's sports be a virtue in and of itself rather than it having to be a, uh, a competitive or a uh, being measured up to or compared to something that's like uh, apples and oranges, right? Men's sports and women's sports should remain what they are. Women's sports are women's sports. Men's sports are men's sports. Why would a teacher come in and try to uh, elevate what is a, a, a female girl to the level of a athletic male? It doesn't make any sense. Mike, we've talked about this before. Our, our favorite in responding partly to Elliot and partly to Will, I would say this to you. Me, me and you, Mike, have had a good laugh at this story on a couple occasions around the year 2000 there's this famous story that that espn really tries to keep out of not only the news but out of lore about espn stories in the past that backfired on them the serena and venus williams sisters that that combo i guess they're like the greatest two female tennis players of all time contacted uh uh, a German tennis player who is ranked around 200th in the male tennis world named Karsten Brash. I think we've talked about this story here. And they thought, hey, he's around 200. We're not being cocky. You know, we, he's not like number 20 in the men's tennis world. 200 seems about right. We could take this guy. And Venus played him first, then Serena. He proceeded to drink a beer, smoke a cigarette, and without warming up, he destroyed them both. And he, he, you know, I think beat one 5-1 and the other one 5-2. Or 6-1, the other one 6-2. So <clears throat> the very question is, is it actually the same thing when we talk about tennis, men, men's and women's? And that's kind of what Elliot's saying. And this is a very able-bodied non-feminist answer well just let women's sports be its own thing but i mean it's sort of a pros and equivocal when you're talking about tennis people will always push this question on serena williams hey you know aren't you the greatest of all time she's like i'm not even in the same sport as men men's tennis which is kind of what elliot's saying right. <laughs> yeah i mean i think that that's a uh yeah, a clear example of um, that type of cover-up. Can um, can we back up for a sec though for the listeners though? Because I'm thinking that if we, you know we kind of hit the ground running because we we know a lot about this stuff, but some folks might not be familiar with Agenda 2030 as you know it's effectively a United Nations initiative uh, that whole, has a whole host of social engineering projects, and and this explicitly is one of them. And, um, and it's also derivative of the uh, UNESCO, the, the UN Education, Scientific and Cultural um, Organization of the UN that uh, was post um, formation of the United Nations and run by none other than uh, Julian Huxley, the transhumanist who uh, wrote New Bottles for New Wine, uh, talking about, you know, re-engineering and reimagining the, the human person. Uh, so that, that's sort of the, the background to a lot of this stuff. Um, but the what I see this as is, you know, we end World War II and the UN forms and the world says, you know what, um, we're not going to do that again. People who have strong convictions, strong commitments to faith, family flag, that equals war, that equals bloodshed. So what are we going to do? We're going to pacify. We're going to pacify everybody. So now we just start having these initiatives to to 
water down and dampen down the culture and dampen down patriarchy and dampen down men. And it becomes, it takes the form of more and more co-ed uh, sports, co-ed everything. Um, and as I've mentioned before, the first rule of counterinsurgency is break up the men. And this is this is derivative of that tactic. Um, and the greatest expression of that is, I mean, I'd say in combat, um, if we go, if, you know, if sports is almost a proxy uh, for uh, having soldiers in the defensive force, you're seeing this very blending of co-ed stuff in the infantry, in rain, you know, the, the whole set of uh, the, the three women that passed ranger school that was totally socially engineered, follow any of Terrence Pop's stuff. Like it's, it's not legit. Uh, they totally gamed it just for the sake of pushing this through. Why? Well, you know, nothing uh, interferes with the um, unit cohesion of a, co of a force than uh, than than a co-ed force. It's, 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 the, it's the 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 number one unit breaker. So, but you know, if you're trying to trying to damp tamp the the masculinity down, that's that's your answer. Just blend the men and women together. And I think this that's sort of what what we're seeing here. This is an expression of it. Yeah, like this is like uh, it started with schools too, right? Like mm -hmm. prior to the world wars, we were in different school rooms, right? Boys were Look at Will. taught yeah. by men and amongst boys, and girls were separated. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, we're seeing it in sports, but it seems as if this has been a long time coming. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Will, you're like you were a teacher at one of the last existing all boys schools, right? Yeah, that's right. Not many of them left now. I think there's about three all boys boarding schools left in the UK. And even those ones are becoming increasingly feminized and changing your attitude towards sports. Boxing got banned, didn't it? That was the most obviously combative sport. Then there'll be moves to try and ban rugby next. All mm -hmm. full contact sports will go. I think you're right about the drive to make men more effeminate, but you can even back that up one step though and see war itself and there's that line of argument saying that ultimately all wars are bankers wars and you've got the world economic forum behind mm. them war itself can be a way of culling the fighting age population of men right. and emasculating a whole culture mm -hmm. yeah is that an emj quote directly well just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sounds like a belloc quote yeah. or chesterton right yeah. the backer of the banker banker of the backer yeah, yeah, no, no, it's not. Uh, <clears throat> I think all, all three of you guys read EMJ, and and people people point out just as an aside, people point out all the time. I've never read EMJ. I, I don't have specific hostility to any of his ideas, and people point out all the time how close a lot of his cultural writings are to what I've written, and and I, I came along later. So even though I, I've never read any of that, it didn't influence me. Sounds like we're um, same ideological direction of travel well there's this whole other answer that that will gave even when one has i think a, a well appropriated anti-feminism approach to female sports the way you do elliot there's always will's first answer right out of the box which is anything agenda 2030 does and there is this small section in agenda 2030 that is committed to increasing the role of females in sports i was just looking at it the, the language just says that so it's not worth quoting directly. You have to ask why. And like Will jumped on right out of the box. The answer is always to lower population. Well, a lot of folks have never heard of the female athlete triad. Here's a, a bit of abstract from a, basically a medical paper. Uh, the female athlete triad is an interrelation of menstrual dysfunction, low energy availability, with or without an eating disorder, and decreased bone mineral density. It is relatively common among young women participating in sports. Diagnosis and treatment of this potentially serious condition is complicated and often requires an interdisciplinary team. Articles from 1981 to present found on PubMed, I guess this is in, this is in England or America, were selected for review of major components of the female athlete triad as well as strategies for diagnosis and treatment of the condition. Now, what uh, Elliot, what I was saying is the first thing you notice when you look that you Google female athlete triad is that it says it's relatively common. They use this term that appears relatively common. Actually, you don't have to be like 
a Olympic level gymnast female in order for the sports to hit you with the triad to make a young woman's period stop to give her essentially early onset uh, osteoporosis and give her this, this calorie absorption problem with or without an eating disorder. It happens early and it happens to lots of girls in sports, but the number, the range is always very elusive. I smell politics behind it. It always will say, well, it's, it's relatively common. It happens between five and 55% happens between 10 and 50%. You see these weird numbers where they're dodging it because they want to avoid committing themselves to the hard fact that even at very low levels of female sports, high school for sports, this can kick in and quite often does kick in. Most people just haven't heard of it, but it is lowering world population to have females in sports. And this is, this is why they want it. I think. Had I you wonder ever heard how much you could relate that to how malnourished we are as a society, right? Like, of course, a woman purges of a lot of minerals and a lot of nutrition in her body every month through her period. But is she replacing that with a, a healthy diet full of, you know, animal fats and protein and the things that keep you healthy and strong? You know, our, our ancestors understood that giving women, uh, ample nutrition for childbearing was at the top of their priority list. And so here we have a society of women who are taught that, well, first of all, they need to eat in such a way that their ribs are showing. Uh, veganism is mainly adopted by women. Uh, women have a tendency to, uh, to avoid eating as much meat or more meat than men do, but, uh, or, or um, eating a lot less meat than men do. But once again, even the studies of, uh, of um, Weston A. Price showed that women of childbearing age needed to eat a lot of animal fats, a lot of butter, a lot of seafood, a lot of foods high in the, the, the minerals that they would be purging on a monthly basis. So I'm not I don't know the answer, but I would assume that a part of the reason why there, this triad is uh, present it's not just because these women are doing stuff. I mean, women have always, there was always a necessity to do stuff, whether it was to be uh, like, my mom grew up doing laundry on a rock. Like she had to like beat her clothes and, and squeeze it out and take it out in the line. Women who had to carry water, they had to do that too in Belize. They carried water. They had to go to the well, walk miles and then carry water back. These were physically active women. These are not women that sat around waiting to get pregnant. These are women that did stuff, but they ate well. And I'm assuming that probably has, that plays big into this triad issue. Yeah, I think the absorption problem, I was reading a little bit more about it last night. I'm no doctor. This isn't medical advice. It's so gay to even have to say that. But um, it's, it's a problem where because of the changed metabolic rates in uh, uh, females, this doesn't happen to males at all, by the way, from playing sports, which I, I want to talk about in a second. I think they have a hard time absorbing all different kinds of calories, healthy, unhealthy. That's my very cursory understanding of it. But the, there's, an, there's a natural law point to be taken in here that I think is undeniable. I think I said it on one of our other shows. I think I said it to you, Will. I mean, if men get big and strong, and fast, they get more fertile. They get more virile, literally Latin for manly. When women get, start excelling with any, any uh, degree of, of seriousness, it, seem, it hurts them. It hits them right in the productivity bone, the, the procreativity bone. And I think it's pretty clear that's why Agenda 2030 would want this. But isn't this a, a strong case for a the strongest case for a sort of uh, queer demonstration, Aristotle style queer demonstration that the natural law is the house and the house takes? You're not going to beat it. Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it. The only qualification I'd make there is that men, too, when they push their body fat levels too low, I'm talking like stage ready bodybuilding often end up impotent and infertile so the message there is that even men when they are 
purely focused on aesthetics and appearance rather than functional performance can damage themselves. And it's not a coincidence that you have the cult of the Adonis and the body <coughs> beautiful among gay culture so much more so than among straight men. Most guys just want to go and lift, have some fun, play some sports and beat each other. They're not obsessing about getting 4.9% body fat and fake tanned. When you do that, then it harms your masculinity. So that's the one caveat I'd add in. And Elliot's point about these women being strong, having to carry water, et cetera. We're not saying that we don't think women should be physically fit. It's really important, especially for pregnancy, for women to have their bodies in good shape. My wife's been pretty much constantly pregnant for the last 15 years. And one time the doctor said that she might end up on crutches because of her ligaments in her hips. And we thought, what can we do about this? And then she started doing some resistance training, just some mild weights, and then it helped. And then ever since then, she's found it easier to deal with pregnancies. So my wife, my daughters, they'll do some resistance training, but we're not talking about obsessively going to other competitions, trying to beat other girls. And that's where I think that the difference comes in. We mentioned tennis earlier. That is a traditionally female sport. Yeah, Tennis yeah. is a feminine sport. Why? Because it's about the display of the body. The serve, for example, reveals the waist, the hips. It's about the beauty of the female form. Ballet is also a female sport. If we look at male sports, boxing, for example, or football, these are much more about the display of physical prowess in terms of preparation for protecting families or for war. So if we look at the two different times, uh, types of sport, it's clear there what they're ultimately for. What we're objecting to is women being pushed into those combative roles. And Michael made some good points about what happens with military training, even untrained male recruits will outperform highly trained female recruits. That's been done, a Marine study, which is Tim's point about the tennis as well. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would give this disclaimer and I'm, I've said this a million times, not just giving this to Elliot that along with tennis, obviously volleyball, Will, your countrymen aren't going to like this, but soccer. Soccer is a sport that girls are naturally drawn to. There's a lot of running, which is uh, associated with fitness, the kind of fitness that that, uh, that curates the, the female physique. It's kind of obviously uh, a different class, a, a sport where if my if my girls, of course, we all we cultivate fitness in the household, but I have six girls. The, the fewer sports they want to play, the better. And would I let them play at, at even an organized sports level? No. But when they come out and they want to shoot baskets with me and my four and a half year old, who we go out there almost every day, becoming every day, we, we don't tell them to go inside. Now, it, it does affect Gaby's attitude toward playing. He's always like, oh, this is a this is a cool dude thing. He always tells the sisters that I want to I want to do dad and me stuff. But I'm like, no, we got to let him shoot with us some. But, but you know, basketball is definitely in, in that other camp. You, the WNBA has shown that it's a, it's a male sport and it's one that should be the exclusive domain of of males. But yes, yeah, soccer is basically running around a field. No offense, guys uh, who like soccer. It's essentially just a sport for running and you might kick a goal throughout the course of the game. Maybe you don't. And so I don't think it's nearly as pernicious, but I'll just say this. There's a, there's a marked sea change in between, you know, when I taught school in 2006, 2007, went away, got a law degree, got a licentiate overseas, uh, you know, worked at a law firm for a short while. And then I came back almost 10 years later and something, and I went back to the same Catholic co-ed school. Something had flipped. None of the girls wanted to cheerlead anymore. All of the girls were in two sports apiece. The, the only girls that were cheerleaders, I, I kid you not, were now the le like the less popular girls. It was more a niche thing. Whereas in 2006, every popular girl was a cheerleader. And I would say 
look at the tonal shift. Look at the attitudinal shift. Michael, in a young girl wanting to be a cheerleader, where it's 100% crystal clear that the main event on a Friday night in fall is a boys football game, a uh, weeknight, any given night in spring is the boys basketball game. The girls are there to cheer. They're the handmaiden. There's no competing girls game afterwards, or if there is, it's it's clear no one's going to go watch it. And all of the popular girls who become the exemplars are there as the best cheerleaders. What's disordered about taking girls from being cheerleaders and putting them in competing versions of the same sport, competing? Yeah, yeah. I think it just gets back to um to the earlier point that I made, you know. This uh yeah, it's disordered and it fundamentally uh takes the telos and the essential role, the protective roles of men that are instantiated or exemplified or honed in sport and and uh models that. Uh and then it furthermore takes the telos uh of women uh for the procreative and uh feminine and nurturing uh capacities and and runs that into the the protective role uh and more and more and that's that is run over a long enough time yeah you're going to end up with increasing areas of androgyny and a muddling down and, and watering down of, of what the culture culture is um or what the nation is or what the society is um i'm just wondering tim you know the elephant in the room here that might be the the saving grace of all this might be you know my my favorite topic is uh <laughs> is isn't this all just going to be solved by trans right didn't we just have some dude that just just murdered like an entire um like the, the entire women's swimming record by like 32 seconds i mean isn't isn't this just going to be sorted out? You you run the game long enough. In five years, there's not going to be women's sports. It's just going to be men's sports and then disordered, like men that call themselves women's sports. And there, there won't be female sports. So we just have to let trans run its course. And then we're <laughs> going to watch A team and B team. That's, that's, that's the trajectory that we're on. So maybe this is a non-issue. You're always more optimistic. <laughs> that I am on that yeah. silver lining. I mean, people are mad at, at the trans, you know, conservatives. And what kills me, there are two issues buried in this. And I, I want to take it uh, to issue A, the, the closer one to answering the call of your question, Mike. And But I do want to not forget about B. There's the answer that I don't know why conservatives are sticking up for female sports over trans. I'm like, no, here, look, I don't like trans. I don't like the feminists. But the, the the pony to pick here is no go with trans sports if you guys are say if the big claim is an egalitarian one that men and women can do the same things anything you can do i can do better then let's have it out then then the leftists if they're intellectually honest which they're not should be all for female sports so my my response to your question specifically is well they're leftists they lie they're not honest Mm -hmm. We already had A team and B team. The second you tomboys jumped into sports and were starting to try to play. Um, so that's what I'd say to the leftists. They're not gonna they're not gonna admit that it's A team, B team any more than they did when girls started getting into sports sometime this century. I, I don't think it forces them to admit anything that they don't want to admit. They just censor, try to actually keep some of the the uh, the men out of drag and in female sports. To me, the side question that I mentioned, the second one is why do conservatives side with the feminists over the trans on this one issue? Seems seems obvious that if you're interested in the natural law at all, you should you should do both. But no, I don't think it's going to solve it. What what do you guys think, Elliot and uh, and Will? Uh, I think I agree with Michael. I think ultimately all the silliness, I mean, whether it be female sports or, or trans, you know, what the trans are doing to female sports or uh, any of the other silliness that we kind of rant and rail about, ultimately is going to work itself out because it doesn't stand up, right? It doesn't hold water. 
So I think, you know, it's fun to have these conversations and to point these things out for people who can't see them or to preach to the choir, but it all, it will all balance itself out ultimately. And if it doesn't by our own choice, well then God will wash us out <laughs> and we'll just have to start over again. Like the cycle of the Bible shows us. I wouldn't be keen on it running its full course to its logical conclusion, because that means equal rights, equal fights. And I don't want to see women getting their skulls right. smashed or killed on the battlefield because that really is where we're going with this. It will be, I don't know if it'll be conscription for women, but theoretically it should be. It should at least be no holds barred women against whoever the next Mike Tyson is going to be. And you'll get deaths. And I'd rather not let it get that far. Um, where, where men most diverge from women physically, it's 4% faster nerve transmission speed for one thing. And no amount of training in the gym is going to change that. No amount of muscle mass that a woman puts on can overcome the speed difference. This is why you never see female to male transitioning athletes make an impact. I mean, who's worried about men's sports from female to male trans? No one. But vice versa, that's where we destroy things. So that's one thing. And then it's also in like sports like darts, for example, the control of um, projectiles in shooting as well. Men are much better at gauging projectiles. That's to do with spear throwing and things like that too, again, to do with war. So this is where it's really heading with the, the arena of combat and warfare specifically. And any, any genuine conservative is going to want to conserve what it means fundamentally to be a woman and wouldn't want it to go that far. Yeah, you guys are worried about it. I, I, in some sense, it makes sense, well, to be concerned with the logical conclusion being reached. But but this isn't something the left ever does. Before it ever reaches the logical conclusion of even a short punch, so to speak, even a short line of reasoning, they're always curating it and manicuring it and making sure that it's standing up semi plausibly to public scrutiny and with this one females in sports huh this sounds like sex egalitarianism huh this sounds like if, if females are equal rights and they want equal fights or equal games there should be according to the feminists no, you know separate no separation between male and female league well i mean why doesn't the nba's push for female basketball constitute not the WNBA, a separate league. Isn't that unconstitutional? Uh, separate but equal. Why doesn't the NBA's push for female sports constitute just a clause that says any females who are good enough to get into the NBA can play in the NBA? And I think the answer, if you're really following the logical conclusion, is that there wouldn't be separate leagues for, for men and women. And that's what you're assuming that the left is willing to go with, Will, Will and Mike. You guys are both assuming that the left plays by their own rules, the rule being egalitarianism. They don't. They're pushing for egalitarianism, though they're still bifurcating the leagues. So that that's proof right there that they're not even willing to let females jump in there. That's why the trans question matters so much. Who's, who's that MMA fighter that's cracked like two female skulls uh i forget his name um i know you're talking about yeah uh yeah yeah um yeah there's there's been two cracked skulls in the history of the man one was a the other was this dude that cracked the hell out of a woman's uh, skull um that hardly ever happens i mean that's that's a lot of impact on a frame not ready for that a woman who steps in the ring in that capacity um, is an idiot as well right so like you know we could we could blame left and we blame these guys that are doing it but why don't women rebel against it why would you step in the room with that why wouldn't you say yeah. no why don't they opt out and say no we won't stand up for this rather yeah. get in the ring and and risk your life you're dumb so she, yeah. I, I don't want to be a jerk but you kind of mm. deserved it right like yeah. what are you trying to prove by getting in the ring that if you beat this guy that you somehow are of you know greater value to the sport no you're just feeding into ridiculousness and putting your life on the line don't do it 
that, that uh that graph that's been going around it's like fuck around find out you know and uh they fuck around and they, they find out and uh that's 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 what happened fallon fox is name fallon, fallon fox. fox i just i just found fallon it cl- closely related terminologically to phallus fox which <laughs> may, maybe he meant it that way mm-hmm. <laughs> You, you can't you can't escape nature phallus yeah, Fallon. Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah she did she did find out and uh, but i mean like will saying that's not that's not what any of us want because all of us are masculine dudes who don't want to see a girl even a dumb girl who jumps in the ring with uh, a, a gender dysphoric man who's going to harm her and did did harm two two separate schools i believe he cracked and uh, you, but, uh, that's the whole point. The irony that we're running over and over and over again and then hitting recycle uh, cycle again is this bizarre phenomenon where men who are not feminists, who have half a brain are like, no, we don't want females to get hurt. Yeah, stay fit, do a little running thing, do a cardiovascular program, do it every day. Your cardiologist says do it every day. Don't even take one day off females i mean there's a big fitness section in in steph's book ask your husband it, it's it's really important to inculcate fitness in your young girls but it's a radically different regime it's a radically different program that they ought to be uh uh running for themselves daily so men are like no stay out of female sports don't listen to agenda 2030 don't listen to your coaches at high school go do something active and by its telos, by its definition, effeminate, like cheerlead, get some cardio in and be a, a rooter for the boys team, which is should be the only team. And, um, you know, there, therefore, you stay out of the way of those big tackles in, in the football game on Friday nights. You stay out of the way of those big, big left hooks if you're talking about, you know, boxing or MMA. And, of course, the female's like, no, no, we want to do it. And they... But they say, because they don't follow it through, but we want to do it in our own leagues, which is inconsistent in ways we talked about. But then you got the gender dysphorics jumping the fences and going and beating the hell out of them in their own league. And we're, we're like, this is contradiction within contradiction within contradiction. Right. As, as a symptom of a cultural crisis more broadly, this has played out in history before as well. Mm, in mm. Falling Rome, the female gladiators fighting male dwarves and Nero making the senators' wives fight each other. It's something that shows a spiritual sickness in a culture. There's a great line from uh, Fulton Sheen. He says, to a great extent, the level of any civilization is the level of its womanhood. When a man loves a woman, he has to become worthy of her. The higher her virtue, the more noble her character. The more devoted she is to truth, justice, goodness, the more a man has to aspire to be worthy of her. The history of civilization could actually be written in terms of the level of its women. And what we've seen from the sexual revolution onwards is basically a drive to turn women into skanks and then reduce men to the level of man boys who play video games and fornicate with them. And then you've got Basically, both sexes done in one fell swoop. And now men are happy to sit there and watch women smash each other up and bleed. And that's the opposite of what a man should be doing, which is chivalry. Yeah, in the history of in salvation history, beginning with the original sin, which is Eve eating the apple and then getting Adam to. It's always coupled this way, isn't it, Will? Where you see the the female taking on the male role and the, the kind of male that will tolerate that begins to take on the female role and you have mutual devastation. Devastation mm. of the whole human race requiring God-man to come later. He wasn't necessary to come at the, at the create. In Genesis 1, Jesus did not have to come down to earth. Right by Genesis four, Jesus has to come down to earth if man is to be redeemed. It's all because of proto gender dysphoria. Like has has that sunk in on everyone? Girls wanting to do male things like play sports and and be the protectors and be the ones to interact with your garden serpents, 
and males allowing that and thereby becoming cucked to the serpents and the other female athletes and all all of the other enablers of this program of gender dysphoria that brought ruin on all of mankind and it brings ruin like Fulton Sheen saying to each endemic culture uh that that occasions it yeah male and female he created them trans is an assault on god's creation ultimately and on natural law and it's an inverted culture where man tries to play god mm. you created me male no you didn't i'm female now just by my instant fiat mm. yeah and i think this this goes also back to as we've we've all talked about uh at length the movement from an Aristotelian worldview to a modernist worldview where the human, the anthropology of the human male and the human female is stripped of telos. So then you're just stuck with, there's just a bunch of tabula rasa atomized individuals with equal rights and the, there's no further distinction. Uh, and, and, so, you know, run, run that experiment long enough and you end up where we're, uh, will just explained by fiat you can just author your own your own essence uh turns out you can't uh but we've been going against the grain of of god's law uh, for quite a while now and this is the apex to what to what extent is it a blindness caused by a technological culture though because if you go pre-industrial revolution and people are doing more manual labor Mm. It's a daily reminder of the fact that women can't do the same tasks that men can. But now, if they're all just locked away in office pods, not having to work with their bodies much, you can see how someone might delude himself into thinking that there are no real big differences. If we want to play sport, fine. There's no male arena, no female arena. It's not like in Germany during the war when there was starvation because the women weren't working the fields well enough when the men were fighting. It's not like the same thing in Russia, in China during the Great Leap Forward. Um, these are times where it was made clear that women can't do manual labor, hard labor in the same way that men can. But I think we've lost touch with that. There's no essentially male job now, apart from maybe something like deep sea fishing. Um, some mining as well forestry logging those make it clear but what other jobs do hmm. also hollywood does a great job of diluting women and men with all these superheroes right like yeah in every movie you watch you've got this skinny fat uh, teenage chick whipping whipping the guy's butts like she's like i remember watching and this was way before i was kind of awoken to a lot of this stuff i remember the movie i took my kids to go watch uh wonder woman <laughs> i don't know it was maybe like 10 years ago and i just marveled at the fact that like this woman doesn't even look like she's in shape she's just <laughs> a skinny fat chick who's literally kicking the butts of like these giant big strong beastly men I'm like, this is ridiculous. And then I just started racking my mind and thinking about like how, I mean, Katniss Everdeen, like all the heroes, all the heroes in these movies now, I think they're coming out with a Wakanda movie now where it's like all the, like the women are all warriors. <laughs> it's so ridiculous, but it makes these girls, I remember me and my daughters, like I would have to talk to them about it too. They would, they would start thinking like, oh, maybe that's true. Maybe I could do that too. Maybe that's available for women, but it's not. And it's so silly. Yeah, dear friends from from my past, dear 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 friends that I haven't talked to uh, about the the madness of the world of the last five to ten years. When we catch up, it it's along the lines of how's your family? Here's my family that are not in the least bit feminist. Uh, who have these are manly men raising their daughters. Uh, I have two friends that I've recently caught up with. And this topic comes up and it's like, I don't launch all the way into it because one can very easily understand the perspective of having your daughter in like karate. It, it, it's, it's errant, but it's easy. It's just like, hey, there's, you know, crazy rapists out there. Learn to protect yourself is, is the errant thinking. 
they don't know what the female athlete triad is. They don't know that, you know, the best thing you can do. Well, maybe they couple this with the best thing that a, a young woman can do. She actually has to live alone, which is CCW, you know, concealed carry permit. But it sounds healthy and it's it's a it's a way of keeping fit. It's better than being on sitting on your butt after school. So it sounds like an attractive nuisance to me. I don't know about you guys, like get your daughter in Taekwondo. She'll protect herself from rapists on the movies. After all, skinny fat chicks are, are kicking giant muscly dudes through walls. It looks really easy. And she's getting her heart rate uh, high enough to, to to burn some calories for, for 45 minutes. What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with it is the entire attitude. And this is always hard to tell old friends that you're just talking to now. I sound hyper political, but it's, it's just the natural law reminding us men and women were created different by God, even tough looking women. And I say that in a highly bracketed way, even slightly tougher looking women lack the, the body chemistry to kick a man down, let alone through a wall. And yet this is all you see. If you turn on Disney channel or kids cartoons, whatever would be the uh, equivalent of the after-school cartoon. It's all female leads, which is a problem. I mentioned that with the difference between who's the cheerleader. On, in Disney now, it's the male. He's leading the cheer for the, for the female endeavor. And they're always like whooping a man's butt. This comes with accepting the premise of the training for combat, which is sport. I, I wonder... Tim, getting back to, to Will's point, though, is, you know, the, this technology issue. Um, there's an essay that I'm still trying to write. I want to call it the Samurai's Dilemma. So you can imagine the samurai has his sword and he's an expert at using that. And all of the arate and the training and the discipline and all the masculine virtues that go into being a samurai. If somebody shows up with rifles and he charges at them he loses if he he loses his culture if he puts his weapon down if he puts his sword down and picks up a rifle to adapt to the technological advantage uh, innovation he's lost his culture as well so you know i could imagine somebody saying no this the sex differences don't matter anymore in terms of defense you know the 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 androgyny woman, the steely-eyed uh, can all push buttons that operate a drone. They can all uh, activate um, psyop operations on Twitter. Uh, we don't need these uh, old old ways of fighting. And if you do, um, you're just going to get steamrolled. You're going to get steamrolled by the fourth industrial revolution, by the um, gig economy. Um I, I don't know. I, I don't know if w w what to say to that. I mean, does that seem like like an actual dilemma that I've um, articulated or or not? Well, push button warfare hasn't arrived, and some military historians just say point blank never will because the reality of closing on the enemy involves some kind of hand to hand combat. Still, I mean, you know that better than most people. So, is it really fully push button warfare? Is that one of those ideas that people have that they use to rationalize male-female combat? Maybe it's just a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I mean, we're, we're not using crossbows anymore, though. You know, we're not using swords. So there, like, there is um, a, uh, a tendency to, to move away from physicality uh, over the years since, since we went from bladed weapons to whatever we're at now. That seems to be the trend. Sorry to put it in these terms, but I, I have to at some point. I have to put it in terms of fusis, nature, versus techne, which is something like art or, or technology. Mike, you know this. A sword is still techne. A sword is still, and, and it's um, it's always a subset of fusis versus nomos, human human convention. There's unique uniqueness to human convention that is specific to human technology. So it's a related question, fusis versus nomos, fusis versus techne. Man imposes himself on nature. And the second, it doesn't matter if a, an A-bomb went off and wiped us all out and we're back to 
you know, primeval times and there's no bit technology, no giga technology, men would start fighting over property again. And at first, you know, the first day it might be hand to hand combat, but even if you wiped it all out by that second day, it's going to be, they've picked up sticks, you know, like the, the apes in uh, uh, space odyssey. They're using rocks. They're using swords. The technology, as it becomes more elegant, physic it, it it surrogates for more of the functions of physical activity, right? So a sword we think of as non-technology. You 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 painted a a, con, um, a little continuum there: sword, crossbow, you know, rifle. You say non non-rifled gun like a musket or something, or muzzle loader, rifle, machine gun, then you get into auto. Then you, you were getting into all kinds of new stuff that the military's developed that they don't even let us see. It's all technology. It's just the more and more nuanced the technology becomes, the less space for, uh, the, the, the greater the mechanical advantage is, and the less space for human physicality there is. So is it a dilemma? I guess, but I mean, like, I don't know. I'm not a samurai. This sounds like one of these things they'd say on one of these shows where a guy just comes in and is like, well, I'm not a samurai. So it's not a, it's not a problem for me. It's, it's sort of the case, right? We're not committed necessarily to defense that, that um, increases physicality as much. I, I agree with Will that it will never go away. Push button warfare will never be a thing that entirely extirpates human physical activity but to the degree that that gets pushed back into a corner i i don't i don't think it's i don't think it's necessarily a problem tacitus records in the history of rome that the celtic women who they weren't forced to fight but they were allowed to fight in the front lines if they wanted to in some of the celtic tribes they killed some of the roman soldiers so even in frontline hand-to-hand combat, women were killing men using swords, clubs, axes when it was Rome versus the Celts. So to me, the question isn't so much the technology. It is about, do we want women to, to die in combat, women to sacrifice themselves for men? I think that comes back to the fundamental question about what the role of each sex is. So it's the male function to protect the family under natural law, the man as the head of the household. But the kind of man who might say, no, not today, you go out and die for me. And then that means that the children are left without the mother. That's where the real inversion comes in, I think. That's the crux of it. Where's the front line now? Though? I guess that's my question. You know, is where is it? Is it... Uh, in cyberspace, you know, is it leaning forward with spicy comment on Twitter? Is it shooting up and, you know, go- going um, to to some uh, hostile location somewhere in in, in the, the other part of the world with, with kinetic weapons um, or, or somewhere in between, I guess. That, that's, that'd be my question. What, what constitutes leaning into the front line or leaning, you know, f- finding wherever that perimeter is, because uh, it seems like it's the, getting uh, the ballot box, right? We had, vi- we had voting <sighs> this week. And um, of course, that's, of course, it's a form of sort of warfare, because we see who, you know, the to- sort of push button weapons they're using now with the technology that lets them cheat a lot easier. But I saw mm-hmm. an article yesterday, I think it was um, Prager you said that 67% of uh, single women, you know, m- childless women are the ones that are voting for um, Democrats. <laughs> I mean, the entire Democratic Party is is held up by women. So that's weaponized. Mm-hmm. That's women being weaponized against our society through the vote, the, the voting ballot, right? Like mm-hmm. voting box. Mm-hmm. Just want to throw that in there. Yeah. Yep. Like you're right. Where it is the front line, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's a good question, isn't it? Um, historically, one of the big functions of men has been to um, establish and then protect boundaries, perimeters. And asking where's the front line isn't just a military question. It's also a cultural one. And I think Tim's answer in 
his book on patriarchy is along the right lines, which is that in some deep sense, the every man's front line is his home. And there's a battle to be won within the context of the family about reestablishing proper order between men and women. That gets a lot done. I don't think it solves everything entirely because men are supposed to be the bridge between the private and the public realms, one foot in the home, one foot in the community. So it goes beyond that, but that's a big front line, the home. Right. right. Yeah. When people ask, okay, well, there's some benefit of female sports, right? Fitness. We've all, we've all four of us have in our own ways here today, acknowledged it. I guess, I don't know if female karate gets a girl 0% or maybe 1% more prepared for an attack from a male. It's it's not going to be efficacious, but maybe 1% more. But why not? Make me the case. Why not? The, the points we've made here today to sum up a little bit are gender dysphoria. It, it, it creates female dissatisfaction with being female. Gender dysphoria leads to a bona fide dyed-in-the-wool misogyny, a true misogyny, the way Will kept talking about, where these are girls that are thinking that the truly feminine things are not worth their time or are worthless. That's true misogyny. Uh, uh, dysfunctional body chemistry, their health will be damaged by it. The, the, the female athlete triad, which I woke up, uh, which I started out thinking about and talking about today, and it's at a relatively low level of female sports. Patriarchy reversal, as we're going more platonic, more ethereal, these the, the virtues inculcated, by all this male activity are inculcating a kind of cheap surrogate for what would be called manly virtue in the females, like a canker on the heart. And it's, it's going to make girls who would be challengers to the patriarchy to in, instantiate some sort of matriarchy, if you will. And that's, that's where the feminism is growing more political. And from there, spiritual bankruptcy, the spiritual bankruptcy that follows upon of uh, men not being the household leaders, not the priest, prophet, king, and the household priest, as JP2 called it, but a, a spiritually bankrupt household matriarchy uh, where women who can't be priest, prophets, and kings, they can't be the priestess of the home, of the domestic church, as it's been called. They just will have none. They will have no patriarch, but the, the matriarchy isn't a thing. Women aren't capable of being clerical priests or household priests. So those are at least five good reasons by my count that we in our own way have, have contributed today, gender dysphoria, body chemistry, patriarchy reversal, spiritual bankruptcy, and a, a diet in the wall misogyny that's being inculcated in female athletes. And I guess you could add in a sixth that once a, a female is so utterly deluded as to think she could be a great basketball or football player, she might think that she can be a great MMA fighter. And after that, a soldier, which seems to be Michael's concern. All right. It's unbelievable, isn't he? Clown world. It's clown world. It's clown world. I, to me, I, I'm not trying to call anybody out here, but I think, I, well, I'll just say, I think it was Cernovich did two tweets in a row some Friday night when uh, I forget what MMA fight, what, what headliner was, but there was like a co-main event that was a couple of chicks fighting each other. And Cernovich made an anti-sports ball tweet the way, the way he does, you know, denigrating any sports with balls in them as if those can't in their own way, play a role in the formation of, of men for military, which they do. Absolutely. Basketball, football, you know, advancing, advancing the flag upfield. And at the same time, then he, he said something affirmative or, you know, better than neutral about the co-main event female fight. And I was like, dude, I normally agree with you. What's, what's going on here when men act like cheerleaders for not just female sports, that's disgusting enough, but the combat female sports it isn't, I mean, Will, you keep coming back to this. Isn't this the height of perversion that you saw right before the collapse of the Roman empire. Yeah. It's a, a culture that's willing to see women die for entertainment. And that's tragic, isn't it? That's the ultimate form of disrespecting the female body and its gift of being able to generate new life. Just watch it die for entertainment. 
And it's no coincidence that the same forces promoting LGBTQ, which of course contributes to population reduction because only heterosexuals can procreate. Controversial to say that I know, but it's true. The same forces promoting that are also pushing women in sports with the effect of lowering fertility. So the two things dovetail. Yeah. I mean, it's the answer to the titular question of this episode of our Christian Catholic masculinism subset shows, right? It's the answer to the question. Why does Agenda 2030 push females in sports? Well, to lower the world population. It, it's always an easy answer with <laughs> with this group of uh, evil Luciferians who run the world. This is always the answer. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you get a bunch of people caught up in it that you probably, I don't know what they would say. I mean, like this is, this is the closing note. I, I want to get each of your guys take on it. What, like I remember Kobe Bryant, who's, who's no saint, but he was a Catholic that at the end of his life seems, I saw him at church one time when I was in law school in San Diego and he was, he was just there to worship the Eucharist body, bowl, soul, soul of divinity of, of our savior just like the rest of us. And, you know, you hope, you hope that he was living out the creed, but um, man, his work at the end of his life, even when you see these Kobe, the nostalgic, sad Kobe uh, films, you know, there are a lot of them since he died. He, he's like, Oh, they're making it a positive thing. And maybe the filmmaker is not trying to be political. They're like, Oh, he's doing so much for girls basketball. He's working with, his eldest daughter and they they were they become real spokespeople for the sport or whatever I, what's a challenge to me i don't know about you guys this is why i want your opinions is how to engage the world on this where we're, we're coming off strong it's like female sports is a psyop um but without like alienating people that like i don't i don't think kobe Bryant knew that this was a un unesco psyop to like kill people in the world or, or lower the, the world population by 40% by, you know, seven years from now. Now that's what it is, but how do you deliver that message to folks? I guess doing podcasts like this is the answer. How do you deliver that message to ordinary folks that are compared against their former lives? If we look at Kobe, he, well, spending a bunch of time with his daughter Playing basketball and teaching others to play basketball is a lot better than running around laying pipe, which is what he was doing before. So I, I, I struggle with the transmission of, I mean, if I'm just being fully honest, with the transmission of that message to normies that don't understand what's really going on behind the curtain. How, how do you think we should do that in a way that's not completely alienating? I, I like that Elliot's opening point. I think that hits all the all the, it hits all the aspects of like, well, what's positive about recreational sport without it being um you know and it brackets that off it, it puts it in its proper order in, in in the rest of the you know catholic social life uh so i think that's a, a great first first entry point yeah i do too i do too i'll say that there's just always a distinction of degree uh slippery slope there I, I as much as i like it and i agree with you what if your daughter's excelling and wants to take it to the next level you know how, how do you how do you put the capstone on goal setting you know at that point like i don't want you trying to get a scholarship with sport x even if it's a somewhat feminine sports like tennis or, or volleyball or, or soccer um, that's the one trick there but I, I i agree with you michael i like that opening point what, what do you guys mm -hmm. think um Elliot and then Will. Uh, well, I think this is the ultimate end in a society that denigrates motherhood. Yeah. And I think by rather than telling people what not to do, right, avoid this, uh, start venerating motherhood, mm. showing them the, the, the virtue and the value of getting married early and having using your body for procreation and how amazing it is to be a mother and to be a wife and to be a homemaker. I mean, I think that's what I try to do with my wife. I know you guys are the same thing. 
I try to do with my wife and my daughters, right? Like the world has so many options for you out there. Of course, you could do whatever you want, but look at how amazing your mother's life is. Look how amazing it is to be a mother. Look how great it is to be a wife and to be a homemaker rather than thinking, well, you know, pushing this, uh, pushing them out of, or telling them not to do these things, raising up what it is that they're actually meant to do. And I think throwing in, I was just uh, enlightened by your uh, sharing this triad, right? So this was, this was huge, just giving people facts, right? Like that's one of the, my daughters are, they play sports, but they're also uh, very much inclined towards living a traditional life. At least that's what they tell me. But sometimes I, we have to talk about it, but why? And, you know, and they, and they wrestle too, because it's what the home values are versus what the world values are. And just having this piece of information, these facts about the female triad uh, just, gives, just gives ample ammo to what we already know to be right and true. So those, those are my two things. Just show the virtue and the value of doing and being all that God created you be as a woman and, 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 and not seeing that as a weakness as a strength, in fact, uh, and then just the facts, the pure facts about, well, what it is if, if you take the alternative, right? Or just even just sh facts are cool, but really measuring up against the contrast. Go look at look at these women now. Now she's having this problem. Or look at family members. Now she's having this problem. Look at yeah. these people in your life. Look at your friend's parents. Now they're having that problem. Now, if you want to have that problem, you want to have that issue, that challenge in your life, well, then you can do the things that they did. Right. But if you want to have a nice life, <laughs> want to have a good life then do what I tell you to do. <laughs> well, before you answer, I, I just if it's OK with you guys, could I add something really fast to what Elliot just said? Something bizarrely specific. How, how do you show how do you inculcate the virtue of wanting to be a mother? You know, something beautiful. They're like, OK, yeah, you get your fitness in. You can run around with the boys for 15 minutes out front, but then come in with mommy and learn to be a mommy. Baking shows. The baking shows on TV are it's like oddly specific for me. They're really they draw you in. And literally we got as we transitioned from season to season, summer to fall, we got back from a big RV trip. And we just, we were sick of eating out. You know, you have to eat out when you're on the road. And we were like, we're going to get home. And Steph and, and my second eldest daughter, who's almost 12, were like, we want to do scratch recipes. And so we've been watching baking shows, the great British baking show. It's like, it inculcates not only the, the, the food, but, and not only the procedure for making home cooked food, but also the challenge, right? Which is what sports are. It's like the challenge, you want the trophy, but you want the challenge to get the trophy. That's the male version. These baking shows are such a lovely way of incentivizing young women. And a lot of young girls watch them from what I'm told, a lot of college girls. I think this is a very healthy trend because there's a, it's a challenge to make stuff from scratch and to make stuff really artful and beautiful. And it is so cheery to have, a couple women in in my kitchen the way it's been for the last month just trying new recipes all the time it sounds specific and i guess it is but uh, that's how i think you accomplish one very real boots on the ground uh uh means of uh instantiating what elliot said anyway well you were gonna you were gonna answer yeah that I, I agree with the baking shows my teenage daughters watch them and they're always experimenting with different things they love it and it gives them a good sense of accomplishment and when everyone else in the family is grateful and says thank you to them, they get that taste of what it's like being a mother providing great meals for a family. Yeah, and Elliot's point is spot on because what is it that ultimately girls, women are aimed at? It's motherhood. That's the distinctly feminine excellence, something that no man can do. A, a man transitioning to become a woman isn't ever really a woman because he doesn't have the potential to become a mother. So this is where the core of femininity really is. And that's what parents have to emphasize to daughters. And when you see that peak female fertility is around age 17, 18 to 25, you should be having your family then. And that immediately will cut out all of this high level competitive sporting nonsense because you'll be pregnant. So you can't do it. 
And then you'll be busy with your kid and your family. So you can't do all the training, et cetera. Why do women have the wider hips that make them worse runners and the angles in their arms and their elbows to accommodate the wider hips and make them worse at throwing and punching? It's all to do with childbirth. Yeah, so yeah. these are the two things that are fundamentally at odds with each other. So get the basics, right? Family, childbirth, and the sports will just fall away as an irrelevant mm -hmm. distraction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's excellent. That's really excellent. Yeah. Mike, did you have, did you, you, you kind of led off with an answer on that, but what, what do you think of what Will and Will and uh, Elliot said there? I really like that. Can you remind me what the, the, the question was, I had a run to go uh, plug my. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I'm just saying, it's more just a closing shot, but instead of just telling, telling the ladies don't do this, it's better to tell them do that. I mean, that's all, that's just how the human <laughs> spirit thrives, right? Tell us what to do. Not what not to do. So, so my instinct is to to approach it from the other direction, right? Rather than telling women uh, to do a particular thing in this domain, I would say to the men to really lean into physical culture and crowd out the women that are uh, entering into it, right? So this is if if men collectively just started becoming much more physical. I mean, this this will be uh, its own podcast uh, thread that, that I want to, to get into in depth. But I think there's a a, a tremendous amount of, of cultivation of, of virtue and masculine virtue and uh, collectively and individually in the space of sport and physical culture and, and taken to an extreme in, in the protective capacities that that takes on in, you know, uh, warfare and and fighting and 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 uh, uh protection and whatnot so i think if men just leaned into physical culture more elliot in the past uh in a past episode mentioned um the whole um uh muscular uh christianity movement in the in the early um 1900s late 1800s uh i think if we revive that ethic i think that would do a lot of good that that i think would the side effect would, would cure and balance a lot of these issues as well. So I think that that uh, would be my my instinctive prescription here. I like it. I like it a lot. Do, do any of you guys have parting shots? We need to talk about that muscular Christianity movement at some point because yeah. it had some weird denials of the value of chastity and virginity as well. They thought that was somehow sickly or... Um, they didn't like it so hmm. there's value in it but i think it went wrong in some ways too so i'm just putting a placeholder so we, we'll come back to it at some point <laughs> great great yeah interesting you got anything elliot uh well you know just kind of full, come full circle and recognize that this conversation is more i think a jab at what the intention of the agenda 2030 is Mm -hmm. than a uh, denial of strength and health and fitness uh, in women. That's not the case at all. Uh, I want my girls to be fit. I want them to be strong. I want them to be able. Um, but this idea that they need to compete with men and uh, excel in sports, uh, I was uh, enlightened to discover <laughs> is a depopulation agenda. And so that it was a great, very enlightening and helpful uh, for me listening to you guys talk during today's show. To pose the question is to assert the premise. No, it, it, I mean, most people, uh, their jaw drops when you tell them Agenda 2030 contains a female sports paragraph or two. Right. You don't even have to say, well, why do you think it's in there? Let's plumb the depths. That's, that's part of the rhetorical value of putting this in the title of today's show. It wasn't the whole of what I wanted to talk about vis-a-vis <laughs> -vis female sports, but it's just, we all know what this is about. If something is in Agenda 2030, it's probably sinister as hell. And, <laughs> and, and so to be like, well, what do you guys think this means is, is my, my attempt at, uh, uh, Socratic uh, rhetoric and I, I I hope it's hit home because a lot of people in the comments have been like what this is a thing I mean who knows this it's part of agenda 2030 what's is this my closing shot I would just say look they're not pulling their punches anymore they're not really operating brutally speaking 
from behind the curtain anymore. I say, I always say behind the curtain, but they're owning it. This is just mm -hmm. Google it. You know, mm -hmm. most of this stuff that we're talking about on this show, most of the stuff I talk about on most of my shows can now be Googled. It's like Agenda 2030 is about population reduction and all of their means to achieve that goal are the specific sub goals of agenda 2030. So it's uh, people out there. I hope, I hope you've benefited from hearing why and how the population reductionists want men and women androgynous men to act like women, women to act like men. Not only do they, you know, they're, they're the, the deep ones deeply steeped in this stuff are Luciferians. And this is the original sin for a man to act like a woman, a woman to act like a man. It destroys the family. Remember what Sister Lucy said uh, in her, her memoirs, that the final assault of Satan on the world will come in the form of an attack on the family. And that seems to be what's going on right now. An attack on men and women, she said, and an attack on the family, qua men and women. And that's precisely what we have now. She said that you know, before even the second half of the 20th century, and we're living through it now. And it means all kinds of androgyny, including female sports. So I hope people have benefited by that. Uh, I think I think next week, who, whose channel will we be on next week? I think uh, Royce White and his, like one of his best friends are, are prepared to join us. Royce has been all over the news. So whoever's got it next week, uh, um, we can hopefully accommodate Royce and his his best friend, AJ Barker, which should be good. I'm looking forward to that. It's Elliot, I think. Yeah, uh, I think so. Okay, I'll need to look into that. I don't know who Royce is, but we'll figure it out. We'll talk about it. Cool. All right. Well, um, thank you, guys. As always, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades, please do like, subscribe, click the notification. That's how you support this channel. Find me on Timothy J. Gordon at Patreon. That's how we keep the lights on here. Do you guys have anything? Would you want to call out uh, your your channels, your projects, and any ways to support you? Uh, starting with with Michael, then Elliot, then Will. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Uh, so, uh, Doctor Michael Robillard. I, so you can find me on Twitter. I think it's uh, Robillard uh, Dr. Uh, you can also find my and Tim's book, "Don't Go to College," on Regnery Press. I also have a book called "Outsourcing Duty." on Oxford University Press about civil military relations. That being said, happy Veterans Day to everybody. And uh, yeah, that's all I got. I'll go uh, Elliot Hulse, two L's, two T's, and Google me if you want to find out. If anything I say sounds interesting to you, I'm on YouTube. Also Strength Camp, also uh, in Instagram. And um, yeah, that's it, that's all. You can get me on YouTube, Nolan Knows, and the same on Substack, which is the best place to get me on. God bless, guys. God bless you all, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades. Have a great weekend. Bless. Thanks, Tim. Peace. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Thanks. Later.